Let me tell you that we are on our way to the top now. Um, I guess it's not the top of Mount Everest, but maybe it's the top of Hochhedrich or Falken or Selikopf or Hochgrad or Buralbkopf or Rindalbhorn or Stuiben or uh, so, some of these. I mean, when you go to Wolpertswende, that's not far from here, then you have a beautiful view of the Alps, and these are the mountains you see there. It's a chain called uh, Nagelflugkette. And uh, I mean, I made it to the top of something like 20 of these in two days this winter. It's not Mount Everest, but it is beautiful. And what we are doing here is not Mount Everest of mathematics, but it is beautiful. But there is a little difference. If you would join me to, let's say, Buralbkopf, uh, uh, then when we are together on the top of this mountain, I can tell you, you have made it to the top. But that's different here in mathematics. I mean, when I am on the top of this lecture, I have no idea whether you followed me to the top or not. You have to decide, and you know it. Huh? If you are not on the top, you will know it. And if you are on top, maybe you will feel it. But it's your, it's your task to decide whether you could follow, follow me to the top or not. I am sorry, I cannot look into your brain. That's the real, one of the real problems in mathematics. Yeah? And it's, you, it's up to you to decide whether you followed me or not. If you did not follow me, maybe it was my fault. But maybe I can't help you. So, and I mean, it is fun to be on top. Either, if, either on Buralbkopf or on, for example, SVD. And you, we, I mean, yeah, we will talk later about uh, these particular summits. Um, now, our first little summit, it's only 1,500 meters high, is clustering. But there will be some higher summits, like 2,000 meters, uh, maybe even 2,500 or 3,000 meters. Let's call them SVD. Um, okay, but let's start with clustering. Um, why did we, I mean, this is a, a little section I just uh, put into this lecture because you uh, wanted to climb this little uh, hill. Um, and do you remember why? Why did we talk about, uh, did we want to talk about clustering? Maybe because our last section was about RBFs. Huh? And actually RBFs, yeah, that's like walking in the Algoi Mountains. Huh? I mean, what we do with RBFs is we want to do function approximation for our points, and then we take such a combination of little hills and maybe the sum, the linear combination of all these hills approximates our data points very well. Yeah? So, yeah. Again, we are talking about such a chain of hills look like Hochhedrich, Falken, Selikopf, Hochgrad, and so on. Yeah? Um, yes, and um, in the, especially in the multidimensional case of uh, uh, approximating RBFs to our data points, we have a situation which might look like that, but I mean this is the view from top to our data points, but actually these data points also have values. And then we are in the approximation scenario, like two-dimensional inputs and one-dimensional output. 
And, and here we want to approximate radial basis functions to our actually three-dimensional data points. And then there was, uh, finally, there was the question, which was the question we did not solve? Maybe we should go back a few slides. Where do we have these pictures? Yeah, like this. What was the open question? I mean, you did it in the exercises. And in the exercises, I asked you to take one radial basis function per data point. I mean, which for beginning is okay, but this is not the perfect solution. Why? What did you observe in the exercises when you fit one RBF per data point? Overfitting. Overfitting, yes. What you get is overfitting, especially if there is a lot of noise. So in, in one dimension, suppose you have really noisy data points. Like that. The underlying function may be this. Now, if you fit, fit one RBF per data point, then uh, you, you get an approximation that fits all the noise. So, it's not a good idea, at least in m many applications, it's not a good idea to fit one RBF per data point. And now the question arises, how many RBFs should I use first? And second, where should I put the centers of my RBFs? Um, and then, I mean, one possible solution for determining the centers of the RBFs is clustering. So, and now we are here. So the top view to our data points in three dimensions may be like that, and maybe there are clusters. This is not true in all, uh, always. But if there are clusters, then, of course, it may be a good idea to like put one Gaussian here, and one Gaussian here, and another one here, and another one here. So in this example, we may have, we, we do actually have four clusters. And here it's a good idea to use four two-dimensional Gaussian distributions. Huh? And as you can see here in, in, these, uh, exam in the example with these four clusters, from these clusters, we could even determine the covariance matrix of our Gaussian. So we would see the variance here in this direction is higher than in this direction, for example. Okay, but I mean, let's start with the basics of clustering. <coughs> so clustering is the task given data points in multi-dimensional space and we want to automatically find the clusters because I mean in two dimensions you can look at the picture but in 15 dimensions you need something automatic. Okay, yeah and the first thing is yeah when we talk about clusters what is a cluster? Intuitively a cluster is a region where the distance between points is smaller than, for example, here. These two points have much a higher distance than these two. And so the first thing we have to do is talk about distance between points. Yeah? And, I mean, the classical uh, distance metric is the Euclidean distance. Um, what's even easier is the squared Euclidean distance, so we just delete the square root here, uh, which doesn't make a difference because the square root is a monotonic function. 
but of course this is faster to compute. Um, you could also use the Manhattan distance. You see we replace the square here by the absolute value. Um, we already talked about this. Or we could even simpler use the maximum norm um, and for certain applications the maximum norm is uh, the best application. But the most popular is the square distance, the sum of square distances. Okay, yeah, we could also use a normalized scalar product as a distance metric. I don't want to go into the details of this here. Um, let's start with our first algorithm, uh, which is the k-means algorithm. Let's, let's look at it, at this picture in the example here. So this, this is a scatter plot of our two-dimensional data points. And these are points I just randomly generated. And I mean this k-means algorithm introduces a really nice iterative idea of how to find the clusters. Um, the idea is we, f uh, in the, uh, we first find the centers of our clusters. But we don't know in the beginning, so we just randomly, we randomly se select two centers of clusters. So we, we, we take this first center uh, just as a pair of random numbers and this one too. And of course they are uh, not good centers for our clusters. Okay, um, so that's what we do first and now we aggregate our data points to the centers. So we take this center and now we <coughs> associate all points to this center uh, which have minimum distance and all points to this center which have minimum distance to this point. And um, yes, we talked already about um, oh, what is it? Richard, please help me. I mean, if we put this line here, I mean, if we co um, connect these two points by a straight line and then we, we take uh, the orthogonal to the middle of this line, we get a separation of these two areas. Um, ah, the, yeah, that's the, the Voronoi tessellation of our two-dimensional plane. Yeah? So this line here is the line separating the region of all the points which have minimum t distance to this center and all the other points which have minimum distance to this center. Okay? So, so you see these are the gray points belonging to this cluster and the black points belong to the other cluster. Okay. So we did two steps. Step, step one is determining the centers which initially is random. Step two is minimizing the distance between all the points and their uh, closest center point. So that's step one. Now in step two we again do these, so in iteration number two, we again do step one and step two. Step one is determine the centers. And now, because now we have two, already two clusters, we determine the new centers just as the center of gravity um, or I mean it's nothing but the arithmetic mean of, yeah, the arithmetic mean of all the black data points determines this new center. And the arithmetic mean of all the gray data points gives us this new center. Okay? Now we have two new centers and now again we associate all data points to the new mean which is closest. And now you get a new separating straight line. If we repeat this process, 
we get again little changes. For example, this point will now be associated to this cluster. And after step number four, it finally is stable and we found two clusters and you see that the separating uh, straight line is somewhere here. Huh? And even though there are no really clear clusters, I would say separating it like that is kind of reasonable. Huh? It's not a bad solution. So this is a, a simple I would call it heuristic, pragmatic algorithm uh, that leads to a reasonable solution. Um, but let me tell you that there is no unique solution. The solution depends on the initial selection of our centers. Um, yeah. But in many cases, cases it works very well especially if there are really definite clusters like in an example like this you would get uh, quite nice results oh uh, yes um, okay yeah and now let's look at the algorithm so the k-means method initially we we determine initial uh, cluster midpoints and yeah, one thing is also important, we have to fix the number of clusters k. This is um, a drawback of this method. You have to manually fix the number of clusters. Yeah? So you should have an idea about the number of clusters. I mean, look, we will use it for our RBFs. And maybe you have an idea of how many RBFs you want to have depending on the noise level, on oscillations of our function, whatever. Okay, so we randomly select the cluster midpoints. In our example, it was k equal to two clusters. And then we repeat these two steps. Yeah? Um, so this step number one here is what we call the maximization step. Actually, here is a minimization. So we classify all data points to their nearest cluster midpoints. Okay, and now we do a recomputation of our cluster centers. And these two steps are repeated until we reach a fixed point. What does fixed point mean? Fixed point means until there is no more change in the clusters. And typically you don't need uh, too many uh, iterations of this algorithm and you get a stable solution. Okay, yeah. Is a stable solution granted? Excuse me? Is a stable solution granted? Um, is there a co convergence guarantee of the k-means algorithm? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, but even if it converges, it's maybe not the solution that would make you happy. But I mean, if you look into details of clustering, you see it, ha it, mu it has much to do with heuristics. I mean, it really depends on what you want, whether this solution is optimal. It's very hard to define an optimality criterion for the solution. Um, yeah. But actually, I don't want to go, to go into, into all the details because this would cost us a lot of time it's, and it's just a sidestep. I, I give you an idea about how to determine the centers for your RBFs. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is again uh, the algorithm in pseudocode. We don't need to uh, look at all the details. Um, yeah. Oh, let me see. Um, yeah.
Yeah, so here you can see, okay, actually it's what I said. Convergence is not guaranteed, but usually uh, you have uh, quick convergence. And here we have some considerations about the complexity. I also don't want to go into these details. I want to show you now a variant of k-means which is called the EM algorithm. And this is of particular interest here because we just did Bayesian reasoning. Yeah? Um, so it's, it's a probabilistic variant of this k-means algorithm. And what we do is, we do an iteration involving these two steps, maximization and expectation. Yeah? Um, yeah. So we need to fix the type of probability distribution of our data. And the simplest variant is we assume we do have normal distributions of our data. Yeah? And this particularly fits very well to uh, RBF, appro RBF approximation because here we also assume that we have some underlying radial basis functions which is nothing but a normal distribution. Okay, yeah. And now what happens here, we, we have the maximization step and the expectation step. Yeah? Um, oh, what's here with the beamer? Oops. Pass <coughs> that. I'm sorry, I don't know what what's going on here now with this beamer. I never had this before. Yeah. Okay, so what we do, what we do is the following. We have given our data points. <coughs> And now initially, suppose we want to fit uh, two Gaussians to them, or yeah, or, and, yeah we, we want to determine two clusters. And then initially, we take the center of cluster one here and maybe of cluster one, uh, two here. And we associate with it a certain sigma or a covariance matrix. Maybe like that. So this is the determination of the, uh, this is actually the expectation step. So we initially fix the center, the mean, and the variance. So we determine the parameters mu i and sigma i. That's what we initially do. Yeah, that's the initial step here. And now we calculate the probability for all data points to belong to this distribution and to belong to this distribution. And then we maximize. So then we, suppose we take this point and the probability for belonging to this uh, cluster would be higher than the probability for belonging to that cluster. And this gives us a separating line. Huh? And now we have this cluster 1 and this cluster 2 and we will now use the data points and determine mu and sigma. You know how this works. We did this before. Determining mu and sigma or mu and the covariance matrix for a normal distribution. You can for example do it with maximum likelihood. Um, or with the pseudo-inverse method. I mean, that's just function approximation. That's really basic and you know how to do this. Yeah? 
So now we determine new mu and sigmas. So we, we did the maximization step and now we recompute the parameters. And this process will be repeated uh, on and on. And now I uh, show you um, an example. Yeah. Let's look at uh, where do we have it? Okay. Yeah. So I wrote a little octave program. I mean, and first I show you the one dimensional case. Um, I produced um, data points. And now, um, let me see, let's look at uh, data. Oh no, sorry. Yeah, this is our set of data points. Um, and now we apply our clustering algorithm to these data points and we fix two initial clusters, one dimensional. This is the first mean 0.7 and this is the sigma 0.4. The second mean is 1 and uh, sigma equal to 1. That's what we do and we get this picture. Look, these are, oh sorry, these are the data points. Um, just one dimensional data points. Um, and now with these two initial settings, what was it again? So one mu was <coughs> 0.7 and sigma was 0.4 and one one. Yeah. And now this is the result already after one iteration. After one iteration, we get a new mu which is around here and quite a large sigma. So this is the, the, the normal density for this green cluster. And now this red thing is the normal density for this other cluster. And you see it already, the, the, the mean has shifted from 1 to something like 0.7. And now we can iterate. This is after the second iteration. So you see now the sigmas are getting smaller and we get this cluster and we get this other cluster. And uh, yeah, let's see how it continues. This is the next iteration and we are finished. Look, this, uh, this delta mu, this is a measure of the change of our uh, cluster centers and mu's. Yeah? So there is no more change, it terminates and that's what we get. So we get these two uh, normal densities and you see that our algorithm found uh, the clusters very well, even though we started with not very good centers and mu's. So the first center initially was here and the second center was here. Okay, yeah, and we can do the same, the whole game also in uh, more dimensions, but now I have to load a different program. Um, yeah. We have to load this one here. Consistent number of columns near line two. What's that? Should I use source? No. Okay, we have to do it the, the basic way. OK. 
Okay. Okay, so now we can use one of these data sets. Yeah, let's see let's use the bigger one. Sorry, last time it worked on this computer. Sorry, this is uh, one dimensional stuff. Sorry, um, I'll show you next time. Um, yeah, but it, it works in uh, more dimensions too. Um, yeah, sorry for that. Um, I'll show you next week. Um, yeah, there are other clustering algorithms like hierarchical clustering um, which I'm not going to tell you in detail here yeah sorry um, we want to go back to uh, our function approximation stuff and we are back at the question how to solve linear equations I mean, that's the very basic of linear algebra. And why is this so important for us here? This is so important for us in functional approximation. How do we get to this equation? We apply a function to data points, yes. I mean, that's actually the point. Yeah? We want, a given is a set of data points, and also given is not one function, but what? <coughs> what is given, that's always the, 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 the crucial point when you start. What is given and what is sought. And what we did, like half of this semester, and maybe one third of last semester, was what? What was given and what is thought, thought? I mean, given are data points, of course. And what else? What is the required input from you as an engineer? A guess of the right functions as yeah. the basis. Yeah. We need to know our basis functions. And then we are looking for what? Combination of these basis functions. Which yes, and, and what's the combination in terms of mathematics, numbers? What does combination mean? The coefficients, yes. So the, the, the whole problem is to find a function
such a function. That's what we are looking for. Yeah? And uh, in the naivest case, we would like f of x i to be equal to y i. Yeah? So this, this means we want to hit all the data points. That's the, the naivest approach. We called it interpolation. Okay, but typically when you have lots of data, you don't want this. You actually cannot achieve this. Why? Overfitting. No, you, in, in many cases you cannot achieve overfitting. I mean with RBFs you can always achieve overfitting. You just take, if you have 10,000 data points, then you take 10,000 Gaussians. But typically you don't have uh, 10,000 basis functions. Look at polynomial interpolation. I mean it would be weird to approximate a polynomial of degree 10,000. Huh? So maybe you want to approximate a polynomial of degree 15. But with 10,000 data points, you get an extremely overdetermined linear system. You get 10,000 equations for 15 unknowns. Huh? <coughs> and that's why there is no exact solution for the linear system you get. And look, this is the linear system you get. This matrix M is what you get when you replace your ansatz into all these constraints. That's the linear system you get. Huh? And it is typically overdetermined. It may in, in some circumstances also be underdetermined. And if you are very lucky, it's exactly determined. That means you get an n times n matrix. And if you are even luckier, then the coefficient matrix is invertible. But that's a very rare case. Huh? Um, I mean, that's what you do in the first few linear algebra lectures, where you have uh, invertible matrices. But in engineering, this case happens almost never. Huh? So we are talking about, I mean, I mean, we are given such a linear system. But this matrix is typically far from a square matrix. It's an over or underdetermined rectangular matrix. Yeah? And now the question is how to solve this matrix. Sometimes we can just invert the matrix and then we have our parameters. If we cannot invert the matrix, if it's rectangular, what did we learn? How can we solve it? The pseudo-inverse method, yes. Man sieht schon, ja, ja. Okay. Um, and for the pseudo-inverse method, M transpose M in the overdetermined case, um, M transpose M must be invertible. Yeah? Um, and in the underdetermined case, M, M transpose must be invertible. And when is this the case? This is always the case, or only the case, if our matrix M has full rank. Yeah? So if it's, for example, a 10,000 times 15 matrix, then the rank must be 15. So the, in the overdetermined case, it's a very <coughs> high matrix, and um, then the rank must be equal to the number of columns. So, or in other words, all the columns have to be linearly independent. Okay, yeah. So you see, the pseudo-inverse method is very nice because it allows us to solve this linear system even if it's over or underdetermined, but not always. It only works if M has full rank. So now suppose even the columns of our overdetermined system are linearly dependent, 
Then we are at the end of our knowledge with the pseudo-inverse method. And also with um, the Bayesian stuff, we actually got the same result. Yeah? And now the solution is singular value decomposition. That's a method that works even if M has no full rank. It's a very powerful method which we are going to look at now. Yeah? Um, and I, I'm sorry, I sent it only yesterday evening. Who got my email yesterday evening? And who watched the movies? Oh, perfect. Thank you. Oh, three students. So you are, you are well prepared. I'm sorry for all those who didn't read my email. But, uh, yeah. You can, you can watch the Tilbert Strang video lectures. These two lectures are actually what would be very helpful now for this lecture. So it's about eigenvalues and eigenvectors and about symmetric matrices and positive definiteness. Yeah? I will uh, very rapidly now repeat a little bit of this stuff. Huh? Uh, first, the definition, two vectors xi and xj are called orthonormal if, if xi transpose times xj is delta ij. This delta is the so-called chronicle delta, which is 1 if i is equal to j and 0 else. Huh? Um, yeah, so that means, I mean, we could write this down easier. Xi times Xi um, is equal to 1. And what does that mean? That means if I have such a vector Xi uh, times the vector Xi, this is nothing but the norm of our vector Xi um, squared. And the, if, if the squared norm is equal to 1, that means the norm of the vector also is 1. So this is a vector of length 1. Yeah? That's where the normal comes from. And the auto comes from orthogonal, which means if, uh, if I have xi times xj and i is not equal to j, then the product is 0. So that means they are perpendicular. Okay, so so much about orthonormal uh, vectors. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, and the matrix. I mean, this is just by um, it's traditional. It would actually be better to call it orthonormal, but that's the term. A matrix A is called orthogonal if its columns are orthogonal, no, sorry, if the columns are orthonormal, sorry. So that's a, that's a mistake here. So that m must be if its columns are orthonormal, then the matrix is called orthogonal. Yeah? Look, I mean, I did the mistake maybe because of this. Yeah? It would be better to have orthonormal here and here. Yeah? Uh, but in the script, please replace this by orthonormal and keep this orthogonal. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. And from this, it immediately follows that for any orthogonal matrix F, A, we have A transpose A is equal to the identity. <coughs> is this clear? I mean, look, an orthogonal matrix is a matrix where all the columns of the matrix are pairwise orthogonal. And what does that mean? If this is one column and this is another column, then the product of these two, oh sorry, we, I forgot the transpose here. Um, the product of these two columns is zero, and that's actually what you get when you multiply A transpose with A. You get the products of all columns with each other, and they are one if 
I mean, look, these are the diagonal co components of the product matrix. They are one and all the other components are zero, so you get the identity. If this is not absolutely obvious to you, please look at it at home. Otherwise, you won't follow me to Buralbkopf. Huh? Um, okay, if you have an invertible square matrix, then all eigenvalues are non-zero. That's just a reminder of linear algebra. Um, if the eigenvalues of a square matrix are pairwise different, so we don't have any eigenvalues which are equal, then the eigenvectors are linearly independent. A symmetric matrix has only real eigenvalues. So there are no complex eigenvalues, which is quite nice. And the good news is we are dealing with symmetric matrices here. Why are we dealing with symmetric matrices? Because we work with the pseudo-inverse method. M transpose M, of course, is a symmetric matrix. Okay, and the eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix are orthogonal. So the eigenvalues are real and the, the eigenvectors, they are orthogonal. Um, and they can be chosen to be orthonormal. What does that mean? I mean, they are, they are guaranteed to be, to be orthogonal, but they are not guaranteed to have a length of one because eigenvectors are only determined to a constant factor. I mean, the eigenvectors, they determine a certain direction, but the length uh, is not fixed. But we can, of course, normalize these eigenvectors and then they are orthonormal. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, and now before we get to a singular value decomposition, um, we do something similar with um, symmetric matrices. Yeah? So, um, yeah. If we have a symmetric matrix A, um, and we calculate the eigenvalues. Then we have, this is the eigenvalue equation. A times an eigenvector x1 is equal to lambda1, which is the scalar, times this eigenvector. That's the eigenvalue equation. Yeah? Um, and if the symmetric matrix is an n by n matrix, we will get n eigenvalues, n real eigenvalues. And here we have these n eigenvalue equations. And now we can combine all these n eigenvalue equations to one uh, matrix equation. Yeah. Um, so we take a times, and now look here, this is a matrix containing as the first column x1, as the second column x2, up to xn as the columns. So it's a, simul a simultaneous, uh, I mean, simultaneously we write down all these equations. So we have A times the matrix containing x1 through xn as the columns, and on the right hand side we need to have lambda 1 times x1 up to lambda n times xn. That's the right-hand side. And now we rewrite the right-hand side as a product of two matrices. Um, yes, and, and here we have to put our matrix containing x1 through xn as the columns to the left-hand side times this diagonal matrix containing all the eigenvalues. Why? Look, I mean, if I multiply this matrix onto this matrix, then this lambda 1 is nothing but the linear coefficient of x1. 
and that's what I get. And lambda 2 with x2 up to xn. Okay, so we can write simultaneously all these eigenvalue, eigenvector equations into one matrix equation. Huh? Okay, and now uh, with uh, some um, uh, notation, we call this eigenvector matrix Q and this matrix containing all the lambdas, we call it capital lambda and now look, this is A times Q here. A times Q is equal to Q times this matrix lambda. So that's what we get. We get now this matrix equation. A times Q is Q times lambda. Um, and now we multiply this equation from the right with Q transpose and we get this equation. So we actually proved now this equation. Um, oh yeah, but um, we should talk about this last step. When we multiply this equation from the right Um, why do we then get this equation? It's not perfectly trivial. Yeah? yeah? You? Yes. The transpose is equal to the inverse. Is this always true? For symmetric matrices? Is this true for all symmetric matrices? No, it's not true. It's not true for all symmetric matrices. Yeah. It is true for orthogonal matrices, but not for symmetric matrices. Actually, these orthogonal matrices, they are not symmetric. Huh? And why is it true for orthogonal matrices? I mean, what is the definition of an orthogonal matrix? Um, a matrix is orthogonal if A transpose A is equal to the identity. Yeah. I mean, and this tells us that a times what is the identity? A times its inverse. <coughs> so the, uh, the transpose has to be the inverse. So from it follows that, I mean, um, yeah, multiply this matrix, uh, this equation from the right with A inverse. Then you get A transpose is equal to A inverse. So that's trivially true for all orthogonal matrices. Yeah? And because of this, we can get from this equation to this equation. And what does this equation tell us? Yeah, we can learn something from it. Oh, and we can, of course, um, also multiply here from the left with Q transpose, and then we get Q transpose times A times Q is equal to lambda. Which maybe is even nicer. This also is very nice. I mean, what do we have here? We managed now to transform our matrix, our symmetric matrix A, into a diagonal matrix. I mean, that's what we call the diagonalization of our matrix A. And there is a theorem which we have actually proven here, which states that for every symmetric matrix, you can find such an orthogonal transformation matrix that makes it diagonal. This is only true for symmetric matrices, not in general. So you see, I mean, this is just a reminder about um, 
matrix transformations or uh, decomposition of a matrix. Look, we can also look at this as a decomposition of A. We can decompose A into a product of here in the middle a diagonal matrix, this one, um, multiplied from left with Q and from right with Q transpose. And such matrix decompositions are really very important in linear algebra. And what we will do when we do SVD, we will find a matrix decomposition of our central matrix M, which is a little bit, of course, a little bit more difficult because our matrix M is not as nice as this one. I mean, this matrix A is it's a square matrix first, and even more special, it is symmetric. So everything is very easy. But what we have with our matrix M, it's actually nothing. Yeah? It's as bad as it can be. Yeah? It's not square, it's rectangular. And it even doesn't have full rank. I mean, that's the, the worst case you can imagine. And look, I mean, maybe we are actually quite close to the Mount Everest of linear algebra. Yeah? Because that's the worst case and we have a solution for the worst case that can happen. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. And I mean what we have now seen or proven that's called the spectral theorem. Every symmetric matrix A has a factorization of this form. The columns of Q are the eigenvectors of the matrix A and these are orthogonal and lambda is the diagonal matrix with all the eigenvalues. Okay, yeah, and now we get to singular value decomposition. And now let me cite Gilbert Strang in his famous book on linear algebra. Um, and he actually writes this at the end of the SVD chapter. I thought maybe I bring it at the beginning of the SVD chapter as a motivation for you. Um, and what he says is SVD is the climax of this linear algebra course. I hope it's the climax of this course for you. Um, I think of it as the final step in the fundamental theorem. First come the dimensions of the four subspaces. You remember when we watched linear algebra last semester, the four fundamental subspaces. Uh, the row space, the column space, space. the null space, and yeah, the left null space, which is the null space of the transpose of the matrix. These are the four fundamental subspaces. Then their orthogonality. Oh, what do we know about orthogonality of these subspaces? Null space and column space are, for example, orthogonal and there is something similar about the null space of the transpose and the row space. Yeah, um, yeah. and then the orthonormal basis which diagonalize A. That's what we have just seen. Yeah? Um, and now it is all in the formula M is equal to U sigma V transpose. And this is our next summit. Yeah? And the last, I mean these are all the sentences from Gilbert Strang. And his last sentence is, you have made it to the top. So, I mean, that's not true for you. You are going to make it to the top. Hopefully soon. Yeah? Okay, let's start with singular value decomposition and uh, let me tell you, it's going to be quite steep and rocky uh, from time to time here. So, this is not trivial anymore. Huh? And, I mean, you have to repeat this at least four times before you understand it. Let me tell you this, maybe even ten times or twenty times. Huh? Look at me, I mean, I am now 53 
and are repeated, I don't know how often, uh, parts of linear algebra. And that's maybe why I understand it a little bit better than you. But it took me 53 years to understand this. Huh? Um, so you have still some time left. But hopefully you get your master before you're 53. Yeah? Um, okay. Now we are talking about such a matrix M, which has not full rank. It's a, a rectangular matrix with uh, not full rank. Um, but here comes good news. M transpose M is symmetric. But it's not invertible. Why is it not invertible? Think of the pseudo-inverse. Actually, in the pseudo-inverse, we have to invert M transpose M. But here it's not invertible. Why? Because M has not full rank. Yes. OK, and now we look at, uh, at the eigenvalue equation for M M transpose. I mean, let's look at it uh, this way. MM transpose is symmetric, and so we can look at the eigenvalue equation, and we know that M transpose M has only real eigenvalues. So this is our matrix M transpose M times an eigenvector VI is an eigenvalue sigma i squared times vi. Don't worry about the square here. Um, I mean just, uh, you could replace it by lambda i. We will see that it's a good idea to put the square here. Um, and of course, I mean you would now object, oh you can only put the square here if it's positive. But we will see in a minute that all the eigenvalues are positive. Yeah? And if all the eigenvalues are positive, we can write them as a square. Um, yeah, and all the, uh, all the eigenvalues positive, then our matrix belongs to a certain class. What's the type of matrix when all the eigenvalues are positive? positive yeah. And actually this matrix M transpose M is always positive definite. And why is it positive definite? Look, we multiply this equation from the left with VI transpose. Then we get VI transpose M transpose M times VI. And this can, I mean now we put parentheses here. Look, if we put the parentheses like that, then we immediately see that here we have a vector times its transpose, so this is the norm of the vector squared. Huh? And of course the square of the norm of a vector, of a real vector, is positive. And so we have shown uh, that M transpose M is positive definite. Because, I mean, the definition of positive definite a matrix is positive definite if, uh, yeah, let's write it down. <coughs> so a matrix A is positive definite if for all vectors x, x transpose A uh, times x is greater than zero. Huh? Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's positive definite. Oh, sorry, uh, this matrix is only positive semi-definite. Yeah, it's only positive semi-definite. So there may be eigenvalues which are zero, but no negative ones. Oh yeah, here and and here we have the uh, the error too. So positive semi-definite. Okay, oh yeah, let's continue here. So this is the square of the norm and on the right hand side we multiply from the left, the same as here, with VI transpose. And now you see we get VI transpose times VI and we know that our eigenvectors are orthonormal 
Um, and this means here we get a 1 and we get sigma i squared. Okay. Um, yeah. And I mean, if we now take the square root here and here, we get that the norm of m times vi is equal to sigma i. Yeah. Okay, and now the next step is we multiply this equation from the left with m. And then that's what we get. Huh? Um, and now we put our parentheses differently. Now we put parentheses like that. And maybe uh, like that. So this red term here is a symmetric matrix. And the blue guy is a vector. So we have matrix times vector is equal to scalar times vector. So this is an eigenvalue equation again. And we are now talking about eigenvalues and eigenvectors of M, M transpose. And that's nice. Look, what, we di what did we hear? Here we looked at the eigenvalues of M transpose M and here we get eigenvalues of M, M transpose. And what's even nicer, M, M transpose has the same eigenvalues as M transpose M. You see, we have the sigma i squared same as here. And that's quite funny. I mean, that's, isn't it surprising? Look, uh, this matrix M is a rectangular matrix. So suppose M looks like that. Then M transpose is like this, so you get a small square matrix. So this is M, this is M transpose. And the product, that's the matrix we are talking about. Yeah? And uh, I mean, if uh, this matrix M is an M times N matrix, so it has M uh, rows and N columns. So this is an n by n matrix. Now let's look at m m transpose. m m transpose looks like that. So you get a square matrix which is much bigger. It's now an m by m matrix. And now this, I mean, and this matrix is symmetric as well as this is. And now what we say is that these two matrices have the same eigenvalues. At least, let's start with the smaller matrix. This small matrix has some eigenvalues. Actually it has n eigenvalues. Some of them are zero and some are positive. And what we say here is that all the eigenvalues we get here they appear with this matrix too. I mean this matrix has more eigenvalues but I can tell you that all the remaining eigenvalues are zero. Okay, so what we, what we have seen is that all the eigenvalues of M transpose M are also eigenvalues of M, M transpose. And all the other eigenvalues are zero. 
I mean, we haven't proven this, but at least, I mean, this is very nice because you can see that the same eigenvalues occur here in this uh, eigenvalue equation. Okay, yes, and uh, yeah, and our eigen uh, vectors here of this matrix are m times vi. Yeah, these are the eigenvectors, and we call, we will call them now ui. Look, these guys up here are the vi, and now the eigenvectors of m m transpose we call them ui, <coughs> and now we normalize them. Look, here we have seen the norm of these eigenvectors is sigma i. So we just have to divide these by sigma i and now we get normalized eigenvectors. What happens if the sigma i is zero? Because that's possible. Oh, then we don't use these. Okay. Huh? We only use those which are non-zero. Because, I mean, that's the only interesting thing, because, because all the others are zero anyway. You learn something from uh, Professor Lehmann now. Whenever there is a division in a math lecture, you have to ask, can the denominator be zero? Um, yeah, so now if the rank of our matrix M is R, then we get R eigenvalues which are non-zero. I didn't prove this, but that's, that's a matter of fact. Huh? So we get R eigenvectors uh, and uh, R eigenvalues which are non-zero, and uh, these are the R um, oh yeah, no, uh, I mean, we get now, I, I, I was about to say we have these R eigenvalue equations. No, no. Look, this is the matrix M and with the matrix M we can't talk about eigenvalues. Why? Why is it nonsense to talk about eigenvalues of the matrix M? Because the order of the polynomial? Uh, we are not talking about polynomials here. I mean, eigenvalues are only defined for square matrices. M is not a square matrix. So there are no eigenvalues. It doesn't make sense to talk about eigenvalues. Um, look, why does it make no sense? It's quite easy. An eigenvalue equation is A times lambda is equal to, uh, sorry, A times uh, eigenvector is lambda times the eigenvector. And that only makes sense if A is a square matrix because this vector has the same length as this vector. Now if our M is rectangular like this or that, then you have M times V is equal to lambda times... It's nonsense to write the V here because look at this matrix. If this V is a, such a long vector, I mean you have something like that, such a matrix and you have to multiply it by a, a vector which is as high as this matrix is wide and the result is such a short vector. So writing V here is nonsense if M is not square. So let's write U here. There is a, you can put a different vector which has the appropriate length here. That may make sense, but it's no longer an eigenvalue equation. And this lambda, of course, is not an eigenvalue anymore. It's a singular value. So what we have here is singular value equations. 
m times v1 is equal to sigma1 times u1. And the v's and the u's are of different size. Look, what are the v's? The v's are the eigenvectors of m transpose m. They are quite short eigenvectors. And the u's are the eigenvectors of m m transpose. They are very long eigenvectors. And that's exactly what we have here. At least we can formally write such an equation. Is this clear? I mean, here we have a vector which has a, a, a different length than this guy here. Okay, but now how do we come to these equations? I mean, it's trivial. Look at this equation. And multiply it from left with sigma i. And that's what you get. Yeah. And if you could follow me up to here, it's not so far to Buralbkopf anymore. Huh? Is there any relation between B and U? For example, is U some kind of projection of B? Um, this is the relation between U and V. Uh, yeah, I can't tell you more than what we have seen here. The v's are the eigenvectors of m transpose m and the u's are the eigenvectors of m m transpose. And of course they are in a completely different space. Yeah? And I mean, this, isn't this a nice, a nice relation? And you will see it even nicer in matrix form and then maybe it makes you happy. Okay, yeah, let's continue putting the whole thing in matrix form. Look, uh, what we now do is what we did before with the ordinary eigenvalue stuff. Huh? Now we have these R equations. Oh yeah, what's important is, oh, let me, let me remind you. This matrix M is a square matrix and M times N matrix. And here we have R, which is neither M nor N. This R, can you, can you say anything about the relation between R and M and N? I mean, here we see R is the rank of M. So that means R is what? Bigger than M or N or what is it? less than or equal to the minimum of M and N. Huh? Yeah. So uh, this matrix M may be um, a 20 times 10 matrix and R may be 2. Huh? Okay. So we can write these simultaneous equations. <coughs> these are the equations we had on the slide before. Huh? And now we write them simultaneously as a matrix equation. So M times the matrix containing all the V vectors is equal to. And now we have the matrix containing all the U vectors times the diagonal, the square diagonal matrix containing sigma 1 through sigma r. Because if we multiply this matrix onto this one, then sigma 1 projects out uh, this vector u1 times sigma 1. And sigma r gives us sigma r times ur. Okay, yeah. Um, but now, because this R may be much smaller than the minimum of M and N, 
we want to enlarge these three matrices such that they get the full size. The full size we need. And that's what happens here. Look, uh, yeah, maybe we should remember that M is M is M times N. So it has M rows and N columns. Um, yeah. Yeah. And now let's look, yeah, let's, let's look what are the V's. How long are these V vectors? I mean, actually here you can see it. We have seen that M transpose M is an N by N matrix. So the length of these eigenvalues vi is n. Huh? And the ui, they have length m because this is an m by m matrix. Okay, remembering this, we look at this matrix here. Look, this is v1 through vr. And now we add some more vectors such that this matrix has n columns and it also has n rows. So this is an n by n matrix. It's a square matrix n by n. And m of course is m by n. So you see we fill up this matrix such that uh, it is a square matrix. And we also fill up this matrix until it becomes square and then it is an M by M matrix. Okay, and but look here, this matrix has R columns and it makes sense to multiply it with this diagonal matrix which is R by R. Now, if we blow up this guy to M columns, then of course we also have to blow up this matrix to an M by M diagonal matrix. And what we do is, we just keep this diagonal as this upper left block and fill up all the rest with zeros. Why does it make sense to fill all the rest up with zeros? because all the remaining eigenvalues of M, M transpose are zeros. Yeah, and yeah, um, I'm sorry for the, the cutoff here, but here this should be a zero and a zero and then the bracket, because this matrix that we have here is not a square matrix. Why? Um, yes, because look at the left hand side. M times N times an N by N matrix results in an M times N matrix. If this would be square we would have M uh, by M and this equality couldn't hold. So we have to multiply this with an M by N matrix. So we even uh, fill up some columns here. I mean, it might, it might also happen that we would fill up some rows here. It depends on M and N. Huh? Okay, any questions up to this point? Um, yes. So now the next step, what we do is we call this matrix V and we call this matrix U and this matrix Sigma. 
So now we get this equality. M times V is U times sigma. And you see it's very similar to what we did before when we solved the eigenvalue problem. We also had such an equality quite similar. And now we multiply again from the right with V transpose and now we get the equation M is equal to U times sigma times V transpose. And again, because V is an orthogonal matrix, is it? Oh, let's look back. Is this matrix V orthogonal? We don't know, because I didn't reveal what these guys are. I just said, okay, we fill up the matrix with some vectors. Huh? Yeah, we, we really have to talk about how we fill this matrix up. Oh yes, and then we, we should stop. So we have this part of the matrix and we have this part. About this part, we know that these vectors are orthogonal. Why are they orthogonal? Because they are eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix. Um, and if we have R orthogonal vectors, they are a basis of this R-dimensional subspace. And now we want to fill up this matrix with vectors which are all orthogonal to each other and to these guys. Which means that in this matrix, finally, we have a basis of the n-dimensional space. Yeah? We have an orthogonal basis of the n-dimensional space. And how can we do this? Look, this is an orthogonal basis of the r-dimensional subspace. What we have to do is, we have to fill up this matrix with an orthogonal basis of the null space of the matrix M. And that's it. Yeah? So these remaining vectors, we use an orthogonal basis of the null space. And because, because I mean, if they are in the null space, then they are all orthogonal to these guys. You remember what we talked in the beginning of this lecture? The null space is orthogonal to the column space. And that's why these guys are now orthogonal to these guys. And the same thing happens here. We also fill up this matrix in the same way and get a square matrix. Okay, and now we finish. Thank you.